Deep in the woods of Chile lies a house, and within this house lies three little piggies, hiding from the big bad wolf on their doorstep, who will do anything to get inside. But believe it or not, this isn't the infamous folktale read to children all over the world, about huffing and puffing and blowing your house down. La Casa Lobo, or the wolf house, is a much crueler, much more bizarre version of these events, about a very real place run by a very real monster. At first, it seems like just an overly strange and confusing horror film, and I won't lie to you, it is both of these things, but take a closer look and you'll catch a glimpse into one of the more disturbing parts of Chile's history. So let's join these three little piggies and peel back the layers of the most bizarre horror movie ever made. Maria, Maria. Now, I have to admit, on my first watch of this movie, I walked away a little unsatisfied. Don't get me wrong, I'm all for ambiguous stories, hell, my channel is pretty much built from talking about them. But The Wolf House takes this to another level. Almost everything about this movie seems designed to mislead you. The visuals, the narration, the music, and naturally, this can be frustrating, no one likes to be misled. But this all makes a lot more sense once you understand the historical context of the film, and more importantly, just who is telling this story. Go in knowing these two things, and it becomes an entirely different experience, arguably a more complete one, but more on this later on. The film opens with a man's voice, a German voice, but speaking Spanish, telling us all about his home through a sort of informative video. Hoy le contamos de sus orígenes y misterios. And from everything he tells us about his home, this place is a utopia, high in the mountains of Chile, where the residents spend their days surrounded by green fields and cute animals, and happy folks just living in the moment. But nothing is perfect, and this utopia doesn't come without a price. It takes hard, hard work for such a wonderful place to run smoothly. Everyone, and I mean everyone, must put in their share. And throughout this story, we'll see what happens if you don't fall in line and play your part in this great colony. But hold on a minute, why would a community of Germans rocking lederhosen be living in the mountains of Chile? What's wrong with the German mountains? Well you see, after World War II, many high-ranking Germans had to flee the country and find a new home, and South America was a common destination as there were no extradition laws, which meant there was no worry of being sent back to Europe to face trials for war crimes. And even to this day, the German influence can be found in many parts of South America. For many Germans and Austrians, Barilo she was a real home from home. The lakes were there, the mountains were there, the Germans were there. This depiction of a happy colony in the mountains isn't really an informative video, it's propaganda. Propaganda for a real place named Colonia Dignidad, which translates to Colony Dignity. But despite what the title and what this opening will have you believe, dignity is the last thing you'd find here. Almost any kind of crime or horrible act you can imagine took place within these walls, although not much was known about it until years after it shut down, because it was so secluded. It was like its own little country within Chile, with its own rules and laws, where these Germans who had left and often fled their own country could live amongst other Germans again. A Bavarian chamber of horror or a pastoral paradise in the Chilean Andes? The answer depends upon who's being asked the question. This is Via Baviera, the headquarters for a 300-strong German colony in the south of Chile. So, we know what the Germans get out of this, but what about the Chileans? Why would they allow all of these Europeans to come build an isolated community in their mountains? Well, it appeared to be beneficial to both parties, at first anyway. Colonia Dignidad wasn't some low-level colony with a few wooden huts. This was a serious operation. The colony had its own hospital and school, which the surrounding Chilean community, mostly made up of farmers, were allowed to use. And these facilities were better quality than anything these farmers would be able to access otherwise. 
there was even not one, but two airstrips, as any goods that the colony produced could be exported directly. And suddenly, all this talk of living and working and helping the community seems a little too good to be true, as most of the ones living in this colony were essentially a workforce, giving it their entire existence to provide items to sell to others, not use for themselves. This isn't a community, it's a business, or more specifically, a forced labour camp. At Colonia Dignidad, you're put to work, no matter the age, no matter how young. Children were separated from their parents and left in the hands of men who were far from having their best interests at heart. And the local Chilean community, which this voice insists they did nothing but help with their resources, had far more taken from them in return. Both German and Chilean children suffered horribly under the care of the colony, the kind of thing which I can't really expand on because of the YouTube guidelines, but it's the worst crime there is. But maybe I'm wrong, because this relaxing German voice assures us that the dark legend created around this place and these people are all lies, slander against them by jealous, uninformed, ignorant people. La leyenda oscura que se ha creado a nuestro alrededor se debe principalmente a la ignorancia. Besides, just look at how calming this informative video is. Every single image is relaxing, flooded with bright green nature. A choir sings in the background, giving this place a holy aura as though we're gathered in a church. And the cherry on top is it's supposedly hidden from the temptations of the outside world, making the commune sound as exclusive as possible, triggering that part of your brain that wants to join the insider club. And if these reassuring words and lovely visuals weren't enough to convince you this place is wonderful, then don't worry, because this faceless man has a story to show us, rescued from the colony's vaults, that will help us see more clearly. And this story is the bulk of the film, called The Wolf House. This colony's twisted version of the Three Little Pigs, a cautionary tale meant to scare any of the children who dare step out of line or try to run away. And it's no accident that this is a version of a classic children's folktale. They want to get this propaganda inside their heads while they're young, because children are impressionable. If a cult can get into the mind of a child, they're much more likely to have them for life. What we're seeing here is the carrot and the stick method. This German voice started off by showing us the good, the benefits of living here and staying in line, before moving on to this folktale, which uses fear as a motivator, showing us the consequences of defying him. Hast du die Fenster und Türen geschlossen? The Wolf House follows a young girl named Maria, an example of what children both within and outside the colony should not be. Just like how real life folktales often serve up some kind of lesson to children about what they shouldn't do, the main character isn't a role model, they're the fool. Cry wolf one too many times and no one will believe you. Trust strangers with candy in the woods and they'll put you in an oven and bake you up. Before I bake you in my oven. But while these famous folktales provide general lessons that any child can learn from, The Wolf House, this tale of Maria, only exists to further the colony's interests, with the main lesson being, you better not leave our paradise or else look what will happen. So The Wolf House isn't just propaganda, it's propaganda within propaganda. And that's why it's so misleading. Everything is designed to trick you into believing exactly what this German man wants you to believe. Nothing can be trusted, even, as I'm sure you've seen by now, the visuals, which morph and change between art styles at any given moment. Body proportions will shift on a whim. El árbol me dio la gracia por llevarle tanto animalito. It'll jump from 2D to 3D to a mix of both. As soon as you think you understand what you're looking at, it's gone and been replaced with a new puzzle. And it's intoxicating. Some might say overwhelming, and you wouldn't be wrong. But you can't say it's not unique. The visuals for this film took five years to complete, and it really shows. It's a lot. But as long as you keep the knowledge of Colonia Dignidad on your mind throughout, all of this intoxicating noise should become a bit quieter.
So who is this Maria? Well, the colony will have you believe she's just some naive, lazy girl who hates working and putting in her fair share. Off dreaming all day. Right before the story begins, she's accidentally let three of the valuable colony pigs escape from their pen. And when she's given punishment for this, no one in the colony being allowed to talk to her for a hundred days, she couldn't hack this either, and so she ran away. It seems like Maria is a quitter, who isn't as good as the other children. She's not cut out for paradise. But again, considering the true conditions of this place, it's almost a guarantee that this work she slacked off on was non-stop and the punishment was much more severe than what we're told. And even if it was simply no one being allowed to talk to her, this is still a very psychologically twisted thing to do, and a common move in cults used against anyone who isn't performing in a way they're expected to. Because we influence one another through our actions and words, so by separating any non-conformers, the cult leaders see it as cutting off an infection before it spreads. Not to mention that isolation is one of the worst punishments, there's a reason that people in prison, a punishment, are thrown in isolation when they misbehave. Because it's an even worse punishment than being locked up all day with company. So it's really no surprise that Maria tries to escape this. But no, this man spins her actions as those of a spoilt brat who doesn't listen to authority. And it's very telling that even in this opening narration, which is supposed to be propaganda in favour of the colony, this man says Maria escapes. But if this place is so nice and lovely, why would anyone even need to escape? Why do you have to even try to keep people here in this so-called paradise? And it's a miracle Maria even does manage to escape, because surrounding the colony is fences and guard towers, with armed guards and dogs. And this is one of the first things we hear as Maria runs through the woods, barking and howling as the dogs chase her down. Maria telling us the wolf is coming. And it's quite clear from the start that the big bad wolf of this story isn't really the kind with fur that walks on all fours. It's the kind with a gun and a uniform, and a whole colony under their control. You see, in the original Three Little Pigs folktale, the wolf is the bad guy. The one coming to eat our little piggies. He's scary. He's mean. But here, the wolf is the one telling the story, because this German voice belongs to none other than Paul Schaefer. The founder of Colonia Dignidad, a vile monster who fled Germany for his vile actions. Following the devastation of World War II, in which 75 million people were killed, there was a big rise in the number of orphans. So this Paul Schaefer decides he's going to do his part and set up a children's home alongside his church. But this wasn't a noble act from Schaefer, as it would soon come out he was abusing his position within the church, when two of the young orphans under his care spoke out against him. Again, I can't get into specifics, but I'm sure you can put two and two together. Charges were brought against him from the German government, but he managed to flee town, and was now on the run. He needed to get as far away from Germany as possible. So he arrived in Chile, and bought 137 acres of wilderness, what would soon become Colonia Dignidad. At first, made up by loyal members of his church back home, who travelled halfway across the world to help build this supposed utopia. So not only did he manage to escape justice, but he managed to bring some of these orphans with him. It's clear that before he even started Colonia Dignidad, Paul was influential. But more importantly, he brought pain and suffering wherever he went. And this is the wolf who wants to snatch up Maria and bring her back to the colony. Maria. Maria. So this voice, this Paul Schaefer, isn't just a monster, he's also a hypocrite. Because while he chastises and ridicules Maria for running away from her home, Paul Schaefer did the exact same thing. Except he wasn't fleeing a bad situation which he had no control over. He was fleeing from the consequences of his own actions. But this wolf will say whatever he has to to get Maria back into his arms. Hast du die Fenster und Türen geschlossen? 
But luckily, very quickly, she finds a house, which she enters, begging for help. And this is when we're introduced to the nauseating animation style, accompanied by some great sound design. The groans of Maria's stomach, indicating it's been a fair while that she's been running through the woods. <laughs> or perhaps that she was being starved while still at the colony, as well as the harsh sound of chalk drawing on the walls. This place doesn't feel safe, at least not yet, but still, it's better than outside with the wolf. When Maria first enters, it's empty, but very quickly, all of the furniture is formed before our eyes, almost as though this house is alive. The calendar on the wall has an image of an eye, and the clock has a face on it, like an actual face. Also, again, I'm sorry I can't show this, but as the window forms on the wall, it does so in a way where for a brief second, it forms a swastika. Even though Maria has escaped the colony, it still feels like she's being watched, and she's carrying the presence of her old home wherever she goes. But at least she's not alone here. As she explores the house, she stumbles upon two little piggies, also hiding from the wolf. Hmm, something seems off. Isn't there supposed to be three little piggies? So why is there one missing? Well, there isn't. Maria is the third pig. You see, under the care of Paul Schaefer at this colony, people were more like livestock than humans. Notice when Maria first appears in 3D paper mache, she forms up from the ground like she's a tree sprouting from a seed. This wolf sees her as an asset, something to be grown and used, just another crop. It's just as the opening alludes to, you're only as valuable as how much work you can do for the colony, how much you can give them. And so, to this big bad wolf, there's no difference between a pig and a young girl. And bound together by their fear of this wolf, Maria becomes a sort of guardian to these pigs, feeding them and taking care of them. Where the wolf sees those under his care as assets, Maria sees them as family, who she will do anything to protect. But while her intentions are different, they're more noble, it's not long until we start to see signs that Maria might not be completely different from Paul Schaefer. Because just like him, she becomes possessive of these pigs in her care, and tells us how she plans to turn them into beautiful creatures. Voy a transformar a mi cerdito en criatura hermosa que nunca me abandonará turning them into something they're not for her own benefit. And that's not to mean that pigs aren't intelligent, wonderful creatures, but to Maria, them being pigs simply isn't enough. But for now, things seem to be looking up. She's escaped the colony, she's building her dream life. But this is where danger begins to seep into her new home. Just like how in the original folktale, the wolf waited outside the piggies' homes, trying to lure them out. Open the door and let me in! I'll huff, and I'll puff, and I'll blow your house in! Here, the same voice from the opening, the voice of Paul Schaefer, pops up every now and then to taunt Maria. Maria. Maria playing on her insecurities, slowly breaking her down to try and convince her to come back to him. As soon as she hears his voice, all colour drains from her and the piggies, and the three of them melt into nothing, as though they lose all control of themselves when he is near, wanting to escape into the earth itself. The wolf tells Maria how he wishes she was happy, but what he really means by this is he wants Maria to be his definition of happy, which we already know is a day of hard labour and twisted punishments serving his utopia, not hers. Maria's utopia is here with a family where she can sing all day and finally relax, and the wolf doesn't like this one bit. This goes against everything he stands for, and so he leaves her with a warning about how a stranger should not enter into a real home. The wolf believes that she will never belong in a place like this, and her home belongs back at Colonia Dignidad. She'll always be a stranger outside of the colony because the colony moulded Maria. No matter how much she rejects Paul Schaefer's philosophy, a part of it will always live on within her. 
And this is when it starts to be implied that maybe there is no wolf on their doorstep, at least not in the literal sense. Again, the goal of this story is ambiguity and confusion, and so we never do get to see the outside of this home. I think it's much more likely that the voice of this wolf is really Maria's subconscious, but more specifically, all of her self-doubt, all of the terrible things ingrained into Maria by Paul Schaefer over her years at the colony. It's not as simple as now she's a escaped, she's free of her captor. A part of her still admires Paul Schaefer because of the constant propaganda and stories like this one. And the wolf's words will only continue to influence Maria the more she tries to separate herself from her past life. But for now, she manages to shut down this self-doubt. After all, she has no reason to step outside. She has food, she has shelter, and if things go to plan, she'll have a family. So the wolf can do nothing but wait, as Maria continues her attempt to create her perfect life within these walls, beginning by transforming her two little piggies into real children. Maria asks the piggies if they want to play a game, where they turn their hooves into hands. Transforma tu pasuñas en manos. It's almost like she has to trick the pigs into becoming more human, holding the ball above their heads, so they're forced to grow hands to be able to reach it so the game can continue. And this scene does a great job of establishing the dynamic between Maria and the pigs. The pigs are as low to the ground as possible, while Maria towers over them. It's almost as though she's their god, and the pigs' loyal subjects completely submissive to her. You see, Maria is in complete control of these pigs, their bodies, their form, even their life. When she first enters the home, she's hungry, and the first thing she stumbles across is the pigs. She could kill and eat them, but she chooses not to. This is probably the first time in her life that Maria has had any control over others. So how will she deal with this newfound power going forward? But this transformation has only just begun, and so these creatures aren't really sure what they are, human or pig. They try to walk on two feet, but they stumble and fall. They can't communicate with words, but they're beginning to realise they are now more than just livestock. Maria gives them dignity in the form of clothes and names, calling them Anna and Pedro. So Maria is one step closer to her utopia, her family. Her children are finally human but only really in appearance. Because they may have hands and feet now, but inside, they're still very much pigs. ¿Saben lo que es una mesa? Their whole life, their purpose was simply to eat and sleep, but now, Maria expects them to be loving children, who listen and obey her every word. But they weren't raised this way, it's not in their nature. Pigs don't know manners, or how to communicate, or how to set a table, or even what a table is. So it's still not really what Maria wanted, but it's a step in the right direction, and she still has hope. After all, if this magic house can turn a pig into a boy, then what can't it do? But whenever things seem to be getting better for Maria, the wolf returns. This time is showing us a bird in a cage, frantically trying to get free. The wolf tells us that this bird is Maria, working from dusk to dawn trapped in her cage. And as deceitful as this wolf is, he does have a point here. Maria has gone from a colony with barbed wire and armed guards to a house with a wolf outside, from one cage to another. But the wolf is ignoring one big difference, because here, Maria is the one in control. And this is when her similarities to Schaefer become even more evident, as she pulls out a book called The Dog and the House to read to young Pedro. La casa y el perro. Hmm, The Dog and the House. It sounds familiar. This book tells the tale of a disobedient dog who never did what he was told. But despite this, the house loves him, the house protects him, and as soon as the dog jumps out the window just to get a taste of freedom, the smell of bones travel along the wind back to the house. Silly dog, the house is always right, the house loves you and the house protects you. Again, this isn't some innocent, nice fairy tale that Maria is reading to young Pedro. It's designed to scare him into never leaving. Again, getting the message across while he's young. The dog and the house is propaganda. So now, we have propaganda within propaganda 
within propaganda. Maria is becoming the exact thing she was running from, using the same tactics that were used on her. The same tactics of this entire film. The harder she tries to turn this place into a paradise, the more it's clear that there's no such thing. Paradise always comes with a cost, and Maria is becoming more willing to pay that cost with every second that passes within the home. So, is Maria a big bad wolf like Schaefer, or a little pig like her children? Well, she's both. Maria is a pretty good example of generational trauma, and how it can be passed down. Maria was tormented her whole life, controlled her whole life, it's all she's ever known. And so, it's not all that surprising that when she herself is given control over others, she goes down the exact same path because she has no other examples to go by. To her, this is how you get people to stay in your life, through fear and control. But coming from the colony, Maria of all people should know that fear and control won't make her children adore her, it'll make them resent her and want to escape, just like she did. But no matter how hard she tries, she can't shake the wolf within. She has nightmarish dreams of her time at the colony, the punishments, the other children, and wakes up crying. No me gusta dormir. And things go from bad to worse. As this new family sit down for dinner, Maria knocks over a glass, which in turn knocks over a candle and a fire begins to spread throughout the house, horribly injuring Pedro and Anna. But this isn't your average fire with red flames, instead it's black paint, pouring out of Anna and Pedro's eyes as though they're burning from within. And instead of screams, the children let out squeals. Another sign that on the inside, these children are still pigs. And this darkness fills the home, returning it to how it looked when she first entered. All of her work is being undone, and she's right back where she started. And at her lowest point, and most vulnerable, with the guilt and grief still fresh on her mind, the wolf uses this opportunity to strike, his watchful eye appearing on the wall bigger than ever. Fühlst du mich, mein Vögelchen? You see, when things are going to plan, Maria is able to fight off the wolf's presence and all the negativity and self-doubt that comes with him. But when things go wrong within the house, it just reaffirms this self-doubt and that voice inside her head telling her the wolf is right gets louder. Maybe she should return to the colony. After all, the original punishment she was supposedly running from was given to her because she failed to look after the colony's pigs, and now it's happened again. She's failed to look after the pigs in her care, and for the first and only time, this wolf's calm, collected demeanour slips away, replaced by anger. Do you want to be a little scolding Maria for burning the pigs. And while I believe that for the most part, the wolf's words are imagined up, it's very likely that what we're hearing in this moment is a real memory. The exact words Paul said to her the day she was punished, in the exact same tone. Du kannst nicht auf die Schweine aufpassen. And that's why it's the only dialogue we hear from him in the entire movie which sounds like this. Maria doesn't need to imagine what he would say in this situation because it's already happened. This is the real wolf. And it's actually this memory and the tone of it which snaps Maria back to the gravity of her situation. The wolf's words seem to be working, he was luring her back to him, but it's this memory, this moment of anger, where he reminds Maria exactly what she's running from. And so, she defies him and gets back to her work, building her perfect life. And there's still hope, because Anna and Pedro actually survive the fire, and Maria believes they're still intact on the inside but it's going to take time to bring them back, or a miracle. In the opening propaganda, we learn of the colony's most prized product, their honey, which isn't just the sweetest honey you'll ever taste, but appears to have healing properties too. And Maria uses this honey to bring back her burnt children, pouring it over them. And again, I can see why someone might find a film like this frustrating, because you have this magical house which responds to Maria's feelings and this magical honey which miraculously heals burns. And I think most people, myself included, prefer magic where the rules are established. Light the candle to open the door. Blow it out to close it.
because magic and feelings are two very nuanced things. So that problem-solving part of our brain is constantly going, asking what can and can't this house do? Why is the honey magic? But in my opinion, this film does get a pass on this stuff, because ambiguity and confusion is such a big theme throughout. And these old folk tales which have inspired the wolf house also tend to have unexplained magic in them. To me, the strength of this film is what it has to say, and the creative way in which it says it. I'm not really all that fussed about how we actually get to that point, but for one reason or another, Maria uses the magic honey and now the children are healed. Actually no, they're better than that. They're new and improved. No longer half-human, half-pigs, confused over their nature, who cannot speak or understand. Now, they have an identity. Maria has finally done it. She has her family, who can love her and communicate freely. But giving her little piggies an identity is the biggest mistake Maria makes. Yes, the children now have the freedom to think for themselves, but the more intelligent she makes them, the more rebellious they become. Me mintió, Ana. Con la boca llena. When Maria's children were pigs, they couldn't talk back, they couldn't talk at all. They had no hands, they were entirely under her control, and could do nothing to change that. But now, without even realising it, Maria has levelled the playing field. This house has gone from three little pigs to three big bad wolves just as the food is dwindling. The family's hunger quickly leads to paranoia, and it's not long until the children begin to scheme amongst themselves. In desperate times like these, someone needs to become the piggy. You see, there never was any option for a happy ending in a story like this. At the end of the day, it's the colony's vision. Paul Schaefer can't write a happy ending for Maria, otherwise it means she was right to leave the colony, and other little birds will follow in her footsteps. Instead, it has to be the complete opposite. The consequences of Maria leaving must be terrible, so the lesson is learnt. Maria wakes to find herself tied up, barely able to breathe, as the camera circles her like a shark. It turns out there is food in the house. Maria. Ambre. 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 Now, the children are the ones in control, the ones with the ability to take life, the ones towering over Maria while she lies flat. It's a great reversal of the shots from earlier, and this is where I think the bizarre animation style shines and is used to its full potential to make the scene more terrifying. The children start off as 2D paintings on the wall, and they're smiling. A bit creepy, but outside of the context of what they're doing, not the most unsettling imagery in the film. It still feels like they can't do much harm, because they're flat, they're not taking up any physical space. But then, they emerge from the ground beside the bed like roots, pushing into the physical space. And now, they really do feel like a threat. But perhaps the most unsettling thing about this scene is what Maria does next. Backed into a corner, she begs for the wolf to come in and save her, reaching out to the very same thing she's been hiding from all this time. She even says, I need someone to come take care of me permanently. I can't do it on my own. Necesito que alguien me cuide permanentemente. You see, it's not enough that Maria just be wrong. She has to admit it and beg for salvation, openly admitting that she is the fool of this story. Because this makes what the wolf does next seem less harsh, because now he's just doing what's asked of him. And during all this chaos, we get a brief glimpse of a painting of a German shepherd. Throughout the whole film, Maria has been calling Paul Schaefer the wolf. When he appeared on the television earlier, he appeared as a wolf. The kind that would eat her. But now, she's seeing him as he wants to be seen. If you let a German shepherd into a field of sheep, it'll round them up for you and guard them with its life. But let a wolf into the field and it'll slaughter and feed on the sheep. The propaganda has worked. Maria has gone from seeing this wolf as a predator to seeing him as a protector. But it's actually the way in which Maria asks for the wolf's help which is important here, using the classic line from the original folktale, the wolf's line, begging him to huff and puff and blow this house down.
And uh, as she chants this, Paul Schaefer's voice joins her, getting louder and louder as the scene progresses. Y soplas, y soplas, y tu pena borras. They're now finally on the same page, finally thinking as one. Maria has completely come around and submitted to his ideals. And before long, her voice is gone, and only the wolf's remains. Y soplas, y soplas. Y tu sonrisa dibujar. Ich bin es. Ich bin hier. Maria has become the monster who eats, who devours. And it's only by completely aligning herself with Paul Schaefer and his philosophy that she is able to survive. And the film ends with the children turning into trees, whilst the squealing of pigs returns. <laughs> implying the wolf eats the children. As for Maria, she turns into a little bird and flies back to the colony, what the wolf describes as her real home. But if the wolf was never really here, then who actually ate the children? Well, in a movie so filled with deception and ambiguity, I don't think it's entirely out of the realm of possibility that none of the miracles we witness actually take place. Maybe Maria just stumbled upon a house with some pigs and hid out until she became so hungry she devoured them. Or, what I personally believe is that everything we see in the story is true, up until the point where the children turn on Maria. In the closing messages, we're told that Maria Verla was rescued thanks to our insistent search, which seems like a strange amount of detail to suddenly give about a fictional girl in a propaganda piece. Why call her just Maria this whole time and then only now switch to Maria Verla at the very last second? It makes it feel like there is some element of truth to what the wolf is telling us in this story. It's altered and changed because it is propaganda, but Maria really did escape, and unfortunately, she really was returned to the colony. But this still leaves the question of how exactly was she returned? And I think the answer ultimately boils down to how much you decide to trust the wolf. Either he's entirely lying and Maria was hiding out when she was found, dragged kicking and screaming back to the colony, or the wolf's ending is more true, and Maria succumbed to all of the propaganda and self-doubt, willingly returning to the colony. And the messed up part is that while this ending seems far-fetched at first, it's actually more likely than you may think. We saw just how much of a struggle it was for Maria to keep the wolf at bay. It's not entirely out of the question that when faced with enough obstacles, she turned back around, back to the only way of life she knows. Because even though the wolf house is propaganda within propaganda, and very much a skewed version of reality tailored to suit one man's twisted goals, there is a lot of honesty to be found here when it comes to trauma and the effect it can have on people. Yes, Maria escaped from her torment physically, but that's only half the battle. The real battle is the psychological one, the stuff you carry with you, the self-doubt, the looking over your shoulder. Ultimately, these things ate Maria from within, and she was never able to break free from the wolf. But how does this ending compare to the original folktale? Well, there are many different versions, but in what's considered the first, the story of the Three Little Pigs by Frederick Warner, the wolf travels from house to house, blowing them down and eating the pigs within. First the straw house, then the wooden house, but when the wolf reaches the third and final house made of brick, he is unable to blow it down. So he resorts to climbing down the chimney instead. But this plan backfires when the little piggy places a boiling pot of water at the bottom of the chimney, which the wolf falls right into. So the pig actually makes it out. But what makes Maria's ending so tragic is that, unlike the third pig, she doesn't get justice. Not only did she eat her beloved children, but the wolf tormenting her is still out there, going about his life. Because I'd love to tell you that this wolf got what was coming to him, that he met some poetic end filled with karma. But Colonia Dignidad was a real place, and Paul Schaefer a real person, and unfortunately, life doesn't follow the rules of storytelling. This place was operational for far too many years, with Schaefer holding power over it from 1961 all the way up until 1997 at which point it finally came to an end when the Chilean government brought long overdue charges against him. 
The allegations led to an official judicial hearing in Germany, as well as the hearing on the libel charges. The Chilean government ordered one of its leading judges to go to the colony, gain access, and try to determine whether there was any truth to the allegations against the colonists. But even then, Schaefer managed to escape these charges, holding one final ceremony before escaping using the tunnels and bunkers beneath the colony. For the second time, Schaefer had escaped justice. Eight years went by, and no one had seen or heard from him. He was just gone. And then one day, there he was, hiding in an Argentinian suburb. <laughs> There was no running this time, no fences or guards to hide behind, and no tunnels to escape into. After years of evasion, Schaefer was finally in custody, and after negotiations, he was sent back to Chile to face charges. Given 20 years for his crimes against both the German and Chilean children of Colonia Dignidad. There were 25 victims in total, but the real number is likely much higher. This doesn't really feel like justice. When the number of years you're given is less than the number of lives you've affected, something is wrong. Although maybe due to his age, they thought, screw it, just get him in there and he won't be coming out anyway. Which is exactly what happened. Just four years into his sentence, Schaefer died from heart failure, aged 89 years old. So this monster had 85 years of freedom, over 30 years of control and power at Colonia Dignidad, and only when he was already on his way out, did he have to give up just four years. Which is why I think films like this are important. To know how to prevent people like Paul Schaefer from becoming so powerful, you need to understand how they work. People don't just wake up one day and decide they're going to join a cult, and more importantly, stay in one. As much as it's hard to admit, these people are influential. They know how to manipulate people. It's easy to look at a story like The Wolf House from an outsider's perspective and think, well, it's obviously biased and untrue. But if you're someone who's grown up in one of these colonies, then it's very likely that these kind of stories are the only ones you've ever been told. These places are diligent when it comes to the information that gets into their communes. You're probably not going to find a wide, unbiased source of information like a library at Colonia Dignidad, because they know that it's hard to form a differing opinion if you've only ever heard one truth from one source. Propaganda works, and it's important to understand it so you know when you're seeing it. And even though it could be frustrating and turn people away, this film is so bold for not explaining the context behind itself. For trusting the audience enough to understand that despite what the ending will have you believe, the wolf isn't right, and the wolf should not be followed. Because if they did do this, there was this moment where they laid everything out, the truth of this man and this place. Even though it might make the film more accessible, and maybe even a more complete experience, I think it would take away from the story's message, which is that things aren't always laid out clearly. What was going on at Colonia Dignidad wasn't. So, when this wolf promises that only his way is right, and that only he can take care of you, trust your instincts and ask yourself, is he really telling the truth, or is there more to the story? You should definitely go and watch this film, because I guarantee you will have a differing interpretation to mine, even if only slightly. And I would go and look into Colonia Dignidad. I didn't touch on it fully in this video, because it's got a long, complicated history, and I didn't want to deviate too much from talking about the film unless necessary and relevant. I really only scratched the surface here. Thank you so much for watching, until next time.